Thank you so much for inviting us today to talk about something that my two panelists and I probably spend way too much time thinking about. But if you have been following the news lately, name calling, fight picking, elbows in the back, it's, is it just another week in the life of our U.S. Congress as a tricky, conflict-ridden institution, or are we facing a governing crisis of new proportions? So particularly given the public's very low levels of trust in mainly Congress, but other institutions as well, today's discussion, what we'll do is we'll focus on um, thinking about the House and whether it's in disorder. In today's discussion between myself, I'm a person who studies Congress um, and how they formulate policies. Jeff Jenkins is a scholar of House speakers past and present, as well as congressional dynamics. And Bill Rush, who focuses on executive branch politics, particularly how agencies and civil servants within them do their jobs. We hope to touch on how unique our current Congress, the 118th may or may not be, the extent to which within party and across party wrestling impacts the actual work of our nation's legislature, the ripple effects on policy for administrators, and of course, if time permits, the potential role of the judicial um, branch and the impact on state and local governments. So first, just to set up our discussion, what I thought I'd do is just cover five basic tenets um, that I think are fairly well accepted, um, facts or beliefs about the way that our system functions. First, the job of Congress is to legislate when needed, as well as provide accountability to our other branches. Second, Congress is made up of 535 members, 100 of those in the Senate, 435 of those in the House of Representatives. Each of those chambers, the Senate and the House, are organized by choice into a number of committees where members, those legislators, can examine policy needs and, policy so and possible solutions as they're crafting bills, as they're doing their job. For a bill to become a law, though, it has to successfully traverse this really gnarly terrain that includes power shots across parties, within parties, competing priorities, along with committees and floor debates, obstruction, killer amendments within both chambers, all while at least some members negotiate a compromise between potentially different versions of bills where, based on some threshold of members within each chamber, needs to assent before it gets sent to the other chamber, agreed upon, and sent to the president. Legislators have lots of tasks and responsibilities that make up that job, including negotiating those deals, deals as well as representing their constituents on the Hill, along with keeping their job by campaigning for re-election. Conflict and disagreements over different policy solutions, how dollars are distributed, or even what counts as important problems make agreements sometimes not just difficult, but as impossible as my fifth tenant and last one. And budget compromises are an ideal place where we see those challenges on display. So I have a few questions for us all to ponder together, um, and then I'll hand over the mic to Jeff. Is our separation of powers structure, that's how our government is set up, more fragile than we previously thought? Or is it we're simply seeing an evolving institution where negotiation is more protracted and the resulting compromises look a little different? How should we examine or criticize how politics impacts Congress, how they organize their potential instability and the outputs or lack thereof? Is there some more useful way to do so? And as legislators spend more time messaging and building their own brand, as well as their campaign coffers, what is the impact on legislating? Has Have differences between parties resulted in this lack of compromise and a legislature that can't get its job done um, or even poorly designed solutions when they do pass policy or are disagreements of factions and gangs within parties the culprit? So I am going to turn it over to Jeff. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of questions in that question. Um, so uh, what is it about the 118th uh, Congress that might make it uh, meaningful to do a podcast? Uh, so I study uh, a lot of things. I'm, a, I'm an American politics scholar. I study American political institutions. And within that, I study Congress and parties. Uh, I wrote a book in 2013 that looks at uh, how speakership elections across time. So the 118th Congress, I've told people, is my Super Bowl wrapped up in a World Cup, right? I mean, it's, you know, I've been kind of hoping, uh, hoping upon hope that I would see in my day uh, a speakership election that might go beyond one ballot, right? Like the ones that occurred somewhat regularly before the Civil War. Uh, so that would not be good for the country, but it would be good for me, right, as a scholar of speakership election. So uh, we, we started to see hints of this in the last 10 years or so. So one of the things that um, you were not supposed to do as a party member in Congress was uh, oppose your leader, 
uh, in, on the, the, the first action of a, of a new Congress, a new House. And that, that is the, the election of a speaker. And for you know, over 160 years, that sort of norm has held. Um, but around 10 years ago, you begin to see some fracturing in that, some, uh, some dissidents emerge uh, to vote against their speakership candidate. Didn't matter in terms of extending the balloting beyond a single ballot, but it was it was a cause for concern. So as, at the end of our book in 2013, we, we noted some of these things starting to happen, uh, and they just escalated over time. Uh, and then finally, you know, in the early part of 2023 in January, we see Kevin McCarthy um, have to essentially wait four days, four days and 15 ballots to get elected speaker, um, and. It, it kind of upended a lot of the, the things that we thought were pretty important tenets of the study of party leadership in Congress, party leadership in the House. Um, and uh, inevitably, people begin to ask us, well, what's, what's going on here? Why did it happen? You know, what were some of the, the fundamental issues that uh, allowed this to you know, actually occur? And uh, we recently wrote a paper that updated that book over the last uh, 10 years. And we we wrote it uh, after McCarthy won the speakership election, but before the second series of drama actually occurred. Um, so um, I'll, I'll, I'll start by speaking, talking about the speakership election. So one of the reasons why people opposed McCarthy, uh, there was a there was a handful, you know, 20 some odd people um, on the, the right part of the Republican flank the extreme right of the Republican flank, who opposed him for various reasons, but ultimately um, uh, a significant set, a pivotal set of them, believed that he was simply uh, representing a House of Representatives and a Republican Party that would not get them the sort of policy that they wanted. And the policy that they wanted was unorthodox. They wanted to essentially upend the system. They wanted to take us over the cliff. They wanted to shrink government significantly. They wanted to make major cuts to entitlement programs. Uh, so some of the questions you asked, you know, are, is this indicating, you know, all of the drama that's occurring in the 118th House? Is this, is this indicating that the separation of power system um, is at risk? And I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I have an answer to that per se, because you know, if you take a look at our constitution, there are no political parties in our constitution, right? I mean, this is really a this is a within party drama, uh, and parties emerged fairly early on in our system as a way to essentially fix problems that that uh, existed in majority rule, right? And it would it would be hard for majorities to continue to act together if there wasn't some glue. Uh, to keep individual members together. And political parties provided that glue. And what we see in the beginning of the 118th Congress is some of that glue start to unstick a little bit. Uh, you have uh, members on the extreme part of the Republican flank who can go it alone today, right? 20 or 30 years, they couldn't go it alone because they would have they would have needed money from party leadership to run their campaigns. They would have needed uh, committee assignments to pass the sorts of things they wanted, to get the sorts of policies that they wanted. And those things aren't as important today. Um, you know, starting under Newt Gingrich in the 1990s, uh, most of uh, the major uh, functions of lawmaking in the House uh, got essentially put in the hands of a small number of party leaders. So the committees became weaker since the 1990s. So committees aren't as important anymore. Uh, you have members on the right flank who are mostly members of the Freedom Caucus, the House Freedom Caucus, and they can raise money on their own. They have their own label. They don't have to rely upon uh, Republican Orthodox leaders to raise money. And oftentimes they could raise, they could raise their own money by, by essentially opposing those leaders. Uh, so we have what exists today. The Republican Party is almost like two parties in the House. You have the, the mainstream Republicans, the establishment Republicans, and you have this group of 20 or so, or, or even as many as 30 or 40 members who can act independently and not be sanctioned. So in the past, leaders had some ability to sanction members who didn't go along with what the leadership wanted. That's no longer true anymore. Um, so that does put at least House um, governing at risk. And to the extent that House governing is at risk, it does put our separation of powers system at risk a little bit in the sense that, um, you know, the, the larger order in our society 
is tilted toward the president and the courts after that. As Congress begins to lose some of their authority, the president, the bureaucracy, the courts step in to fill that vacuum. Um, first thing you said was uh, Congress's jo job is, is to legislate. And I think different members of Congress interpret that question differently. What does it mean to legislate? I think a lot of us believe that passing, passing bills and enacting laws means legislation, right? More stuff, more stuff, increasing the size of government, right? I think that's what some of the members on the, on the, the, the extreme right of the Republican Party would say, Chip Roy and others, right? And they say legislating means standing firm against increasing the size of government, right? Fighting against bills that are no good, that are increasing the national debt, right? Um, so individual members of Congress have a very different approach to um, what the traditional job of Congress actually is, right? Chip Roy and some of the, the members on the extreme right flank think that they are governing. They are doing a good job of governing. And their constituents think that they're doing a good job of governing. Um, so I think we've been seeing, you know, the 118th Congress was the culmination of this, but we've been seeing this as scholars of American politics and scholars of American political institution. We've been seeing signs of this for a good decade or more. Um, so I, you know, there's probably lots of, lots of individual questions that you want to kind of break down and ask me in that big question. Uh, I think I touched on at least some of it. Yeah. So, and we're collecting questions over here in our Q&A. And so I'll kind of hold on to those. And I've got a few um, to ping back to you after um, we give Bill a chance. So basically, Jeff has set us up to really thinking about the 118th Congress and individual members in it and um, and weakening committees and this vacuum that um, happens when Congress isn't passing new pieces of legislation or if, if things are at a hold in Congress. So um, but given that previous Congresses have passed pieces of legislation uh, delegating a policy implementation, oftentimes to federal agencies, what does this mean for policy then in terms of implementation? Uh, you mentioned that the executive branch and courts step in. And so formulation and the inner workings of Congress, that's only one part of this larger part of governing. And so to get those policies that are already passed <laughs> out into the world um, and doing the things that those policies are crafted to do, agencies are implementing those within the executive branch led by the president and appointees. Um, so we'll turn to Bill to help us move forward. If legislative um, legislating in the sense of passing bills has decreased and obstruction has increased, what's the impact on agencies or on policy implementation on the country, on people? Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, that's a lot, right? Um, so uh, first of all, I want to kind of emphatically agree with Jeff. This is uh, kind of unfounded, uh, the the power that individual members within Congress have right now vis-a-vis uh, -vis party leadership is uh, something that we haven't seen, at least during my lifetime, and Jeff would know better in terms of previous lifetimes, since he's also a historian in many respects. Uh, but that said, uh, I, I think we've found kind of obvious signs of dysfunction increasing in Congress. And what I study is the administrative state, and I study the president's relation to the administrative state uh, uh, more so than Congress's, but the um, but the kind of inability of Congress to govern leads to dysfunction, not just in, within Congress, but it leads to dysfunction across our administrative agencies and further delegation to states and locales, which uh, I think Pam is much more of an expert on in terms of uh, the federalist design. But if I was just looking at the federal bureaucracy, uh, you can think of how various uh, you know, signals of dysfunction, such as gridlock and legislative inaction, which, which Jeff talked about, uh, budgetary uncertainty, how that could affect agencies, or how um, inconsistent policy changes, having legislation through continuing resolutions just kind of stay static without meaningful change in the legislation means that there is a lot delegated to the administrative state in terms of articulating past intentions of Congress without clear signals of the current Congress as to what their preferences might be, which leads to more autonomy for administrative agencies, but at the same time, uh, agencies that are still answerable to Congress and don't have as credible 
of a commitment in terms of a partner in Congress uh, uh, through which to govern. And so what happens with these things is oversight challenges, of course, uh, from uh, Congress kind of weakening uh, th uh, through a weakened party structure. It also means that um, parties have to reward kind of maverick legislators more so than they used to, which means putting them to chair oversight committees uh, that in many times uh, reflect their own kind of like particular preferences over a policy or over a, over an agency's domain, uh, which in many respects can uh, put that agency in a negative spotlight, could uh, perhaps lionize an agency that they're very supportive of, but at the same time not lead to much substantive oversight, more so it's a lot of signaling. Um, we see the power of individual legislators uh, uh, that they're taking up vis-a-vis -vis the party such that there is less compromise. Um, even Speaker Johnson, who seems to have uh, a larger kind of uh, a larger swath of support than his predecessor, uh, has stated how he's looking to decentralize uh, the power of the speaker, uh, decentralize power to individual legislators. And in doing so, that's going to complicate the ability to work across the aisle and find compromise. And so with that, you get eroding trust in government because you don't see a clear agenda. And that eroding trust in government leads to dysfunction at the administrative levels. So the, everyone is labeled as part of the government, regardless if you are responsible for those legislators' actions or not. And so we see things like confirmation delays. Uh, we see the ability, uh, this is obviously in another chamber, but we see uh, kind of the same types of phenomena where maverick legislators are taking the ability to really, um, yeah, uh, glue up uh, processes that normally went uh, uh, rather smoothly uh, through either, either one of the houses. So um, one thing that you could see is less uh, ownership of Congress over policy, which means that there's more role for the president to insert uh, their preferences into the implementation design of policy. You also see further deference uh, by Congress or, or actually a growing reliance by Congress to uh, rely on the judiciary uh, to arbitrate things within the administrative uh, state. And uh, and then you see dysfunction that leads to diminish, uh, diminishing administrative capacity. If you have a faction of, of Congress who is not interested really in governing, more interested in advertising their own positions, and when those positions, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jeff mentioned Chip Roy. Chip Roy, in the last government shutdown, when it, uh, which was 35 days, uh, said he wasn't worried about a fight over funding a government that most people know I can't stand. That's a pretty large kind of axe that he's taking to a very complex, you know, uh, bureaucratic structure that's responsible for a ton of different policies, right? And so if you're not really interested in the intricacies of governing and more interested in symbolizing your, your general stance against government, what you get is diminished morale within the administrative agencies, increased turnover within these agencies, and uh, implementation uh, dysfunctions. Uh, so when you have a phenomenon like government shutdowns, you have less attraction to for talent to go to those agencies, talents to stay in those agencies, less attraction by competent contractors uh, to uh, rely on the commitment of government to, to follow through on those contracts. And so uh, basically what you see is a talent suck across uh, or, or a, a talent pull away from government uh, generally, which leads to capacity issues within our administrative agencies such that you the graying of our workforce uh, uh, becomes extenuated. Uh, we have uh, uh, no, basically Congress lacks any uh, notion or compunction to uh, think of long-term uh, strategic 
uh, human capital within our administrative agencies such that uh, in key positions, we are aging out without anybody being able to replace these people. And the unattraction of a dysfunctional government means that talent is not you know, uh, lining up to be in these agencies, to be answerable to a Congress that's not interested in governing. Uh, I can give you plenty of examples. Uh, I've recently written a couple papers on uh, the effect of the most recent government shutdown, showing that agencies could not meet their statutory, uh, statutory deadlines, uh, showing that agencies uh, were delayed in their ability to uh, deliver basic uh, public policy, um, that they diminished in customer satisfaction as a function of the shutdown, and that there was increased turnover uh, as a function of the shutdown as well. Um, you have to remember that not just, not just, uh, um, you know, quote unquote, bureaucrats, that is, those civil servants that work directly for government, uh, were uh, interested in leaving government. You had a lot of contractors who were not paid as a function of the shutdown. At least the civil servants eventually got paid, but the contractors did not. What, what does that say about the credible commitment of government to see through uh, partnerships with the private sector, with the nonprofit sector? And also, uh, Pam, something that you could talk about is uh, what that meant, uh, not just from the shutdown, but this general dysfunction at the federal level, what that means in terms of implications at the local and state levels as well, uh, given our complex federalist system. So with that, I'm going to stop. Uh, I believe uh, Vana might have uh, given a couple links to those papers uh, in the chat. Happy to talk more. More about that or just general phenomenon that you've seen in terms of dysfunction as it goes uh, from the legislative level down to the administrative level. But uh, with that, I thought I'd give some time to Pam because she is kind of the perfect expert between Jeff and I because she focuses on delegation issues from the legislature to the administrative state and more so how it trickles down in a federalist system. So Pam, um, would you like to add anything? There? Sure, I actually, what I might do first is we yeah. have a number of questions in the Q and A. Um, and so I have a couple to pose, uh, maybe one to each of you to start, but I think you can probably ping off of each other and maybe we'll kind of make it more of a conversation now. So we have um, a question about how Tuberville was able to single-handedly obstruct military appointments. So that's a question about the Senate, right? And uh, the Senate is a very different uh, legislative body than the House. The House is a majoritarian body that's uh, built really on a lengthy set of rules. Uh, the Senate is a much more deliberative body, smaller, and is much more norm-based across time. And the Senate allows uh, each individual senator to object to a series of appointments should he or she want to. This is called a hold. So any, any senator can put a hold on uh, one or more nominees. And what, what and, and what that does is not necessarily stop it, but it really slows down the process, right? It forces party leaders to um, take much more time uh, and much more effort uh, to get uh, a series of uh, appointments done. And what Tuberville is essentially doing is uh, he is placing holds on uh, military appointments uh, and uh, promotions as a way to uh, draw attention to something that he does not like. And that's the, the recent change in the Pentagon abortion policy. So Tuberville is essentially using this as a way to slow down appointments uh, and to message constituents, right? Message donors. Uh, so one way we might think about the, the Congress today, whether it's the 118th Congress or whatever, whatever Congress, whatever modern Congress we're talking about, uh, a lot of what we see in Congress is messaging. We could almost call our, our Congress today the messaging Congress. Uh, so a lot of a lot of members of Congress, either in the House or the Senate, they're not really interested necessarily in policy, right? What they're interested in is communicating to their voters, their donors, uh, their special interests, anyone back home that they care about, that they are doing a good job that they are fighting the good fight, right? That is especially clear on the right part of the Republican flank, right? They're not interested in passing policy, but they are interested in communicating back home to their constituents that they are, you know, they're trying to drain the swamp, right? And they're trying to, you know, essentially fight back against uh, the, the socialist Democrats 
and the increasingly socialist leaning establishment Republicans, right? And their efforts to actually pass policy. Um, and this is just a different way, right? Tuberville is just doing this messaging in a different way. He's saying, you know, in effect, I don't like this policy change. And every time that, you know, you turn on the television, there'll be 30 seconds devoted to me standing up and preventing more, uh, more members of the military from being appointed or, or, uh, you know, or anything else. And when they, and when they, and while they might not have any policy interests, they're, they're more interested in in signaling, uh, their behaviors uh, certainly have policy impl implications, right? And so there's a, a vast amount of research that's been emerging over the last five years, part of which I've been involved with, but also uh, people like Christine K uh, Kincaid at uh, Yale, or also David Lewis and Chris Piper uh, from Vanderbilt. Uh, Chris is actually now with the Partnership for Public Service studying uh, appointee vacancies, but uh, a vast amount of literature that's showing that appointee vacancies lead to diminish performance in these agencies because uh, careerists are not interested in taking uh, blame uh, in many respects uh, for uh, what happens in an agency absent leadership. They want someone who has the kind of credentials of uh, congressional approval uh, to be in that leadership position uh, to uh, uh, protect the agency in many respects in terms of how it implements policy. And so therefore you get more risk aversion within the agency. And simply you have people doing too many different jobs at once because someone has to fill these leadership roles in temporary status, and often they have to maintain their, their current responsibilities while they're juggling a second job as well in this leadership position. Ironically, it also empowers the president vis-a-vis -vis Congress uh, to be able to push policy towards their preferences more aptly, uh, particularly if they're fundamentally against the mission of the agency itself, right? Because if there's no one in this uh, congressionally approved position, that means that the president has the opportunity to subdelegate to a unilateral appointee or a, a high level careerist with whom they might have a high level of policy agreement that may in fact take that position to lead or to push the agency more towards the president's preference than Congress's, right? Right? And so that is that is a big policy implication, just a simply from the lack of personnel or the lack of leadership that Congress is causing because of this dysfunction. Um, so, oh, no, I, and you actually you answered another question partially in the Q and A. They wanted now, to know um, how uh, political turmoil impacts civil servants. And you were talking about how um, many administrators are doing multiple jobs. And this person also wanted to know, does it have a different impact depending on the rank of the civil servant? Oh, yeah, I, I would think absolutely so, uh, particularly those that are in uh, policy making positions uh, are you know, uh, quite afraid to take stances uh, that might be against the preferences of the future leader of that agency, right? And so, um, you know, if you're in an administrative position that's largely clerical, you can keep on doing your job as you're expected to do, right? But if you have more policymaking uh, responsibilities within that agency that are directing actual outputs for the agency in a substantive manner, that is in a substantive direction, uh, you might be more risk averse uh, during, during a vacancy uh, to make uh, innovative change, to make a positive change just in terms of the efficiency of the policy as a function of uh, not knowing what the preferences of the incoming, the next incoming appointee might be. And so uh, having an appointee in place provides you a lot of cover in many respects and also provides you kind of clear signals from Congress and the president simultaneously as to the direction they prefer for policy for that agency. Sure. Jeff, I have a couple of questions here about um, sort of the organization and size of Congress. So the first one is um, the House hasn't increased in size since 1911, and 435 members are representing ever larger districts. Uh, most democracies have smaller district sizes. Do you think this factors into the current dysfunction? Okay. This is actually a, a question I've written a couple of papers on. Not this particular question, but a portion it over time. Uh, so there's there's pluses and minuses here, right? I mean, if you 
you increase the size of the house, you would have districts that were smaller in the terms of number of people. And that all else equal should allow an individual uh, member of Congress to better represent that group, right? Uh, a smaller, smaller underlying population. The problem is uh, Congress is also a deliberative body. And as it gets larger and larger, collective choice, right, which is at the heart of what Congress does, becomes more difficult, right? You have now a body of 600, 700, 800 members of the House that becomes increasingly large. You know, the chamber becomes perhaps unwieldy in terms of size. Uh, it becomes harder and harder to uh, negotiate intra-party agreements and settlements. Uh, in, this, in this era, that could simply allow for, especially if you made districts smaller, you could have more and more groups like the Tea Party emerge, right? You could have particular kinds of geographic interests uh, be represented better in a much bigger house. So it's one of those kind of uh, counterfactuals that we think about a lot, right? What if, you know, the, it, you know on, a, on a certain level, it would be better if a member of Congress represented a smaller geographic population. But what does that do to the actual uh, governing ability uh, of uh, a chamber like the House? It's, it's, it's a bunch of trade-offs, right? Very, very aptly put. There's two more questions about um, sort of rules or org or limits, constraints on members. Uh, so one person wants to know, is it the lack of term limits that is pushing forward this dysfunctionality um, because members are fo not necessarily focused on urgent policy matters, but instead on their own careers? And the other is about sort of specialization through committees is that is it actually efficient to have smaller committees giving recommendations to a larger body such as in the Senate or the House? Yeah, I'll take the, the, the first one first. Um, so uh, it's interesting, right? Political scientists hate term limits. Um, you know, most of the political science lim literature suggests that term limits don't do a good job. It doesn't change how a member of Congress votes or um, usually it's done at the state level, right? We, we have term limits in some state legislatures, and we're able to study term limits there, it doesn't necessarily change how member, uh, members of a legislator vote. And it takes out members and eliminates their expertise once they're out, right? So you're, you're, you have this constant rotation of individual members in. Once they start to actually learn the process of governing within the legislative body, they have to leave, right? So if you believe that expertise, legislative expertise is important, you would probably oppose term limits. Um, there's been no real evidence that term limits lead to better outcomes, better legislative outcomes, changing how members of, members of a legislature vote in a way that's consistent with some of the things that the, uh, the, the question asker uh, mentions here, right? They're not focusing more on uh, doing a good job and passing bills and, and focusing on urgent matters. Um, on another level, right? I mean, you might, you might also think about um, you know how old uh, our Congress actually is, right? How many how many members are octogenarians and 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 over, right? And you begin to ask questions. Okay, well, expertise is good, but actually maybe it's U shaped, right? Maybe it's not strictly linear, right? We get to a point where more expertise kind of hits a you know kind of a global maximum, but after that it starts to decrease, right? As an ability as someone's ability to do the job, have the the acumen to do the job starts to go down. So there are people at the outskirts, and I think increasingly political scientists wonder, well, you know, in our federal government, that, you know, given, the, given the, the dynamics that exist and have tended to exist in the last couple of decades, and how, we're, how our Congress is just getting older, members just stay forever. Members stay until you actually have to take them out, right? Physically take them out on, you know, on their backs, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, the recent uh, Senator from California, for example, Right, uh, who wasn't? It wasn't clear what she actually knew at the end of the day. Right, um, uh, whether she was actually following what was happening. So you know, uh, you know, the, the one of the big, you know, the big reasons for keeping uh, or avoiding term limits expertise might might require a closer look, depending upon the type of legislative system that we have. Right, our our congressional system, you know, we might we might take a harder look at the role of expertise. 
If I if I could just add on to that, uh, one of the arguments against uh, term limits as well is the pressures that legislators that are facing a limit might have in pursuing particularistic policies based off of the revolving door practices that term limits uh, induce, right? And so when they see the window of leaving, then their interest may become even more self-involved in terms of what their post-legislative career is going to involve. And that means who are agencies contracting with, uh, where are they sending grants, uh, so on and so forth. And so there might be further kind of uh, corruptive influences as a function of, uh, of term limits, uh, pressuring legislators to then pressure agencies towards particular outcomes. And Bill, there's another question for you, I think. Um, are the specific damages to the administrative state caused by the constant threat of government shutdowns from Congress? Are, are there specific damages, not just yeah, I, shutdowns, I, but the threat of them? Yeah, I like that. Uh, I like that question. I saw it and I was thinking about this, that, that there's actually not really good evidence one way or another. But one thing that I would uh, uh, that I'm working on currently with my uh, a group of uh, data science students here at USC and a couple PhDs here at the Price School, uh, we are um, collecting, aggregating um, uh, job placements in the federal government over the last five years. Um, and adding to that panel uh, quarterly. So hopefully, you know, within a couple of years, we'll have more than five years worth of data. But the point being is that we're interested in how uh, specific political events kind of exogenously affect the labor market, the public, the federal labor market uh, for the public sector institutions. And, and to see, you know, uh, we have data on, you know, the relative talent that are applying for these jobs, the gender and, and ethnic distribution of, of the applicants and how long it takes to fill these positions. And we're and we're hypothe hypothesizing, but we don't have, we haven't ran these models yet. We're in the midst of collecting the data, but the idea is that these jobs are becoming less attractive, the more political dysfunction there is. And a government shutdown is a very, very clear signal of government dysfunction, right? And, and as they become more frequent over time, uh, that means that one of the key or kind of one of the one of the highlights of government work for many people is the stability that government work provides right and if you are interfering with that stability uh then it's it makes the jobs less attractive and uh and many times particularly in highly professionalized positions across the federal government you're not meeting the same pay standards that are established in the private sector and so you need to balance those incentives with other incentives such as stability such as you know autonomy to pursue you know intrinsically interesting work like if you're a scientist for NIH or something like that right but if you're facing the prospect that you're going to have to close your lab for 35 days and uh you know and start from scratch again, uh, then maybe it'd be better to work for, you know, somebody in the private sector as opposed to the government. So I would, I would hypothesize, although there's not good work on it yet, uh, that the, that the threat of dysfunction is just as powerful as the actual dysfunction. Because when you're in the agency and you've experienced these dysfunctions, people can become rather thermostatic over time, meaning that they're used to you know, these bad events happening, they start to internalize them, they get used to it, they they find it, they, they've adjusted to the new equilibrium, right? But for those outside of the federal bureaucracy, I'm, I'm imagining that this signal is pretty bad. All right, next we have a question um, that they, this uh, questioner would says, so far you've entirely overlooked, overlooked the fact that less than two years ago under the Democratic Party, the House passed very important legislation. In short, it's the Republicans' fault. Why not say that? You know, we typically study parties in a, in a positive way, right? We, we, we tend to think that they, um, you know, the parties, parties operate and the individual members of, of a given party operate in the same way that they they care about the same things, right? And they pursue they pursue their their goals in the same way. Um, but I also think this this you know this person's question is important in that uh, uh, you know the the current 118th Congress uh, the reason that we're seeing this dysfunction is because the Republicans are the majority 
And their majority is very narrow. They only have a handful of members, right? In, in you know, that allow them to be the majority. Um, uh, it's very slim. If the Democrats were the majority in the 118th Congress and they were slim, right? Would we see the far left of the Democratic Party? Let's call it, let's, let's assume the squad is the far left of the Democratic Party in the House. Uh, would we see the squad essentially trying to take the country over the cliff or, or shut things down, right? Because they weren't getting their way. Uh, it's a good counterfactual. It's a good question. Uh, we don't know the answer to that. My, my hunch is no, they would not, right? The squad is different than the far right flank of the Republican Party. And that the squad uh, cares about policy, right? They want to they wanna produce more policy, just like the establishment members of the Democratic Party. They simply want more of that policy or more extreme versions of that policy than the, than the, the modal Democrat and the mainstream Democrat. Very different than the right part of the right part of the Republican Party that essentially wants to upend the entire system, right? Change the system completely. Um, so while we don't typically talk about asymmetric parties, right, and asymmetric behavior on the part of pivotal groups of parties, um, I think it's I think it's an important thing to mention, and it's it's more than just being a an angry pundit to bring this up, right? That the Republicans are to blame. I think this is a this is a this is particularly a Republican problem, right? The, the norms within the Republican Party as to um, supporting the decision of the conference and backing the leader, right? Essentially, got wiped away in this Congress. Right? All of the all of the 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 internal norms that allowed the Republican Party to govern as a majority party got eliminated in this Congress. And I, I don't see that happening within the Democratic Party. I don't see a scenario that would lead to the Democrats just dissolving, right? Breaking yeah. down like this. You know, maybe I could, I could spin a few assumptions in the future that might, you know, create some conditions where that might occur. But in the year 2023, right, the Democrats would not have broken down in the same way. Em emphatically agree. And you said it really well, I thought, earlier as when you were talking about the preferences and what they believe legislating means is very different from Republicans to Democrats or from the far right to the far left, um, all of those sorts of things. So um, we do have a question about these labels of socialists, libertarian, hard right, leftist. Um, do we need different definitions? Um, and what issues define the political spectrum of Congress? So this is, a, this is a good question, right? So I, I keep talking about things like the far right flank of the Republican Party, right? I'm thinking about kind of a left right version within the Republican Party. And oftentimes you'll, you'll hear and you'll see news reports, especially during the speakership uh, battle, that the, the moderate Republicans, right, were opposing this hard right flank. Um, there are no moderate Republicans anymore, right? Not like they were 50 years ago. Everyone within the Republican Party in the House is conservative, right? They're all conservatives. Uh, when we think about hard, you know, hard right flank and moderate, I think what we're typically thinking about is most of the Republican Party can be considered in the House moderates in the sense that they believe in they believe in the typical way that you organize a party, right? They tip, they believe in the rules for for supporting a leader, right? They believe in all of those things that existed before, and the hard right flank is essentially an anti-establishment flank, right? They, they have their policy preferences. They want to take us over the cliff, but they also have no respect for the, the typical rules of leadership, right? They have no typical, they have no, no um, respect for um, essentially going along with the majority, right? The majority decided within conference that they were going to support a particular leader, right? Whether it was McCarthy, whether it was Scalise, whether it was Emmer, and the far right said no. No, he's not. He's not one of us, and we're not going to support him. And we're gonna we're gonna shut down the house until you essentially choose one of our guys. And the moderates, after three weeks, essentially said, "Okay, all right, we'll we'll take Mike Johnson. He seems like he could be okay. <laughs> we'll see. Um, but we gotta we gotta get back to work, right? So you know, the the moderates are essentially establishment Republicans, but they're all conservative today. Um, so, you know, I think when we when I use certain terms and we use certain terms, we need to be 
you know, perhaps more clear about what they mean, right? Um, you know, like like the like Martha's asking here, right? Some of the some of the traditional words that we use may mean different things in 2023. I think that's kind of related to the other question that was posed, Pam, which is, you know, how to, you know, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, if you don't mind, I'll just uh, read or summarize the question. So Karen is asking, along with the rise of maverick legislators who are unbound by party leadership preferences, is this kind of you know, coinciding with the rise of independent voters. Um, and, uh, you know, does this mean that these trends, maverick legislators and independent voters are possibly connected? Um, well, the problem here is that many of the quote unquote maverick legislators are happen to be on the far ends of the um, of the ideological spectrum uh, for both parties. That is the more maverick behavior is coming from the far right within the Republican legislative uh, uh, caucus and and the more maverick behavior, I guess, is coming from the right of, of the Democratic caucus, respective caucus, but not uh, maybe a little less from the left. Um, I, I would say that uh, people tend to still uh, vote primarily Democrat or primarily Republican, regardless if they call themselves an independent. So most uh, both parties kind of find reliable independent voters that identify highly with their policies, right? That identify highly with um, with the Republicans' uh, platform or with the uh, Democrats' platform. So while there's a rise of independent voters, uh, their behaviors tend to stay fairly the same. Yeah, so ultimately, one of the questions is kind of floating around out here, especially with regard to the dysfunction today in the House and the dysfunction that's being led by the Republicans, right, the, the far right of the Republican Party, is what, what does it mean to be a member of a party team? Right? What, what obligations do you have when you call yourself a Republican or a Democrat and you're elected as such to a national legislature? What are what are your obligations? You know, clearly you have to represent the voters who sent you there, right? maybe the donors also who helped put you in that seat. But what is your obligation to the other members who call themselves Democrats or Republicans, right? Your team members in Congress. Uh, ultimately, that was pretty important, right? That you were you were supposed to go along with your team, unless it was something that was extremely important to your district, right? You were supposed to go along with your team. You were supposed to follow the leader, right? We have we have books called Follow the Leader in political science. Uh, and these members, you know, these 20 some odd members of the Republican right flank don't believe in that. They, they, they believe that their obligation is to themselves, uh, their constituents, and oftentimes to a higher power, right? And it's not to their leader and it's not to the other team members. Um, and that's dangerous, right? If you believe that legislating is important, if you believe one of the things that a, a legislative body has to do is produce produce laws, right? If not new laws, but actually just continue existing laws, right? Um, you know, that there are going to be, there are going to be laws that need to be re-upped because they, you know, after two years or three years or four years, right? Uh, they're, they're sunset and you need to re-up them. Uh, if they're not willing to do that, then it does become dangerous for our system as a whole. And it does allow, you know, uh, the bureaucracy, given all, given all the problems that the congressional dysfunction already creates for the bureaucracy, the president, the courts, and state and local governments to step in. And, and Pam, we have 10 minutes. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the state and local part? Sure. Um, and just to let everyone know, so we only have 10 minutes left. So if you had um, like burning questions, make sure you put those in the Q&A and we'll at least try to attempt to, to give you a little bit of attention towards the end. So one of the things that we have waved our hands out a little bit is talking about this ripple effect on state and local um, leaders as well as governments. Because at the local level and at the state level, oftentimes we have governing institutions organized in similar fashions as Congress. Um, but in addition to that, much of what uh, state and local administrators federal fe work with federal agencies in partnerships, utilizing federal dollars as well as state and local funds, um, among others, to implement policy. And so when you have dysfunction at the federal level, that results in sort of a bifurcation in some ways 
where some states and localities are really stuck and choose not to to move forward with um, priorities that perhaps um, they had before and others uh, feel, and it's very similar to some of the administrative state stuff that Bill was talking about. They feel a little more open to pursuing things. It's just they don't have that federal backstop or federal backup with respect to um, help with with dealing with new challenges and that sort of thing. Plus, states face balanced budgets for the most part. And so that is a huge issue. And dealing with the repercussions of that, if the federal government also is failing to um, fulfill some of the responsibilities that they have, that can be um, quite uh, difficult and challenging to continue doing the things that we've asked them to do in the past. Um, In terms of other sorts of things that happen. It's not just states and localities, but there's also ripple effects to the court system. Uh, and, you know, depending on how you view uh, appellate courts, uh, district courts, appellate courts, and federal courts, as long as well as some state courts. But uh, w- what we have to think about is that when the federal, when Congress isn't legislating, that what's happening is agencies are stepping in to, to take care of needs that are arising from our our population. And as a result, sometimes they may or may not be overstepping the boundaries of previously passed delegations of authority to them. And so courts are now entering the fray and making choices that could potentially have really huge implications for previous delegations. And so I think we are looking forward to, or looking ahead, not forward in a good way, to what could potentially be um, a, a huge problem for agency work and um, and also how Congress is going to deal with that. So that's my quick, quick take that probably is waving my hands at a million things. Um, but we've got three different questions on the docket here that are not about state and local or court stuff. So perhaps we should um, Pam, take these. Pam, in- yeah. If I could just if I could just add to your point uh, in terms of uh, how it affects local or state kind of not just elections but policy implementation more you know uh we did uh um through our clear initiative here at usc we did a a few diary studies of uh local administrators and something that we found emerging was this kind of nationalization of local issues of um that administrators at, at municipal administrators are uh, becoming more and more frustrated with uh, constituents kind of approaching them with national level issues or accusing them of being part of the deep state. Uh, and they're like, you know, guy, I'm just trying to fill your potholes, right? And <laughs> that's uh, I, I'm interested in how deep the pothole is, not how deep the state is. But uh, more and more, I, I, I think that this dysfunction that we see at the national level is kind of trickling down to uh, 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 to how people perceive the state generally, regardless if it's federal or local. And uh, and frustrating, again, a lot of the uh, civil servants who are just there to do a job. Yeah, so this is... This is the nationalization of politics, right? Which is a a growing literature across different subfields in in American politics. And if if you look at some of the Gallup and Pew results in terms of public opinion and trust, um, it has up till now typically more trust in local and state governments over at least the past 50 years or so um, than in federal institutions. Um, And up till now, more trust in the courts than in um, the president, and then Congress is always last. But so it will be interesting to follow over time what that means for the public. But we see both <laughs> eroding at uh, at rates that we did not see earlier in terms of the trust that those institutions have. You know, and there was a time, you know, you go back a number of decades, you know, pre-Watergate, when a majority of Americans trusted their Congress, right? America, they had They had confidence in Congress. Uh, you know, since the Vietnam era and the Watergate era, right? We've just seen trust go down, right? We just don't have much faith anymore. Um, and, you know, members of Congress are incentivized to act, you know, in accordance with that distrust sometimes, right? Um, you know, you can spin conspiracy theories and get reelected, right? In some districts out there. So, 
So it's interesting because in public health, so uh, that's my other hat. In public health, we of often say when public health policies are doing their job, you don't even notice them. You have no idea they're there. And so what I wonder is the extent to which when governing is working, is it that we just don't notice um, those good things? It's good. Yeah, we say that about umpires in baseball, too. Right? So umpires yeah. doing a good job. We don't notice them. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's probably um, right. We've also, we've also, however, seen more complexity in our policy implementation regimes. And with that, that means further delegation chains and the role of government becomes obscured to the point that in many respects, a lot of Americans don't even know they're getting government services um, because it's being delivered by a bank or by an insurance company or whatnot. Um, when, uh, but when that policy domain fails, they sure as hell know that it was the government's fault, right? Yes. Um, yeah. One of my favorites was during the healthcare debate. There was a, a sign of a person hold or a, a person holding up a sign that said, "Keep your government hands off my Medicare," which is, of course, a government program. So, um, <laughs> all right, we have about four minutes left. Why don't we do a lightning round? If you can address any of the questions that remain in the Q and A, feel free to address those. Uh, but I'll, we'll go Jeff and then Bill, and then we can wrap it up. No, I'll take the last one. Um... You know, where gerrymandering might be a problem in terms of keeping members in safe seats. And that's that, that is true on both sides of the aisle, right? Both Republicans and Democrats. To the extent that you could potentially move down a, a road where uh, redistricting occurs in a apolitical fashion, uh, would that keep members of Congress more on their toes, perhaps, right? Um, Possibly, right? If they if they realized that you know they had an especially unsafe seat, or that there was a real chance that um, you know they they could lose their seat, would they be more responsive? Right? Uh, probably. Uh, would that would that lower their performative stature? I'm not sure. Right? Um, you know, members members can do a lot with their performative actions. Right? They can. They can appeal to constituents very well in terms of their performative actions. So I'm not sure if that would change their kind of their their set of actions. Would they do less, you know, messaging? Would they actually try to pass more things? I'm not sure, but it would reallocate uh, what they would actually do and how they would spend some time. I would imagine. I could try to, you know, I, I'll give a a statement that might, you know, kind of blanket cover these uh, other questions about the relative division that we see and extremism that we see mm -hmm. in our system. Um, you know, uh, people who study constitution writing, like uh, uh, comparativists who look at different types of constitutions, uh, particularly of democracies, uh, it, you know, I will tell you that the Weimar Republic's constitution was a beautiful document, well laid out. The fundamental weakness of the Weimar Republic is it depended on the belief of all actors within that republic uh, to respect democratic preferences, right? And so when you got a faction that was large enough that really had no respect for democratic preferences, then uh, those institutions crumbled fairly quickly, right? Whereas uh, I, I believe that in our constitutional system and, and kind of Madison's axiom of having ambition, check ambition, they were aware of extreme elements of extreme opinions uh, relative to the, you know, to your median voter, so to speak. Uh, but we are being tested more so than ever. Uh, and in terms of how our constitutional system uh, can accommodate a faction that doesn't really believe in, um, you know, um, how the will of the people is defined through elections currently. Um, although, of course, our, our styles of elections and, and the relative directness of, de of democratic choice to our institutions has evolved over time. Um, it will be interesting uh, if if there is an executive in place once again who does not recognize uh, the will of the people through the majoritarian principles of of democracy, that would be very very tenable uh, or tenuous, I should say, for for our democracy generally. To have an actor in place, a chief actor in place who does not respect democracy. And we are at time. So 
One of the takeaways here is that there is a lot of chaos. There's a lot of conflict and pushing and of policy priorities and power and dollars um, or the lack thereof. And so perhaps we are in a dysfunctional Congress at the moment. We'll just have to keep our eyes on um, C-SPAN and uh, see what happens next. But thank you all for joining. Thank you to our panelists, both Jeff Jenkins and Bill Rush um, and the Price School for hosting. Thank you to Pam. <laughs> and Thanks, thank Pam. you to our cute, the, the folks who are watching. Your questions were incredible. I'm sorry we didn't get to them all. Um, and I hope you have a chance to dig into some of the websites that we put up here or grab um, the books and sites that we put up as well. So thank you all.